Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the TriggerCast. It's your host again, Sweeney, and today I have on a good friend and very awesome, awesome man in the arena of business, Tanner Larson. What's up, Sweeney? How's it going? Very, very good. It's chilly over here in Florida, so I'm, I'm always grateful. <laughs> I got 20 degrees outside right now. You're probably going at like 70, and you're cold. It, it's I got it turned to 60, so I shut the windows. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. it started getting too cold. Um, I got a floor heater, and I've got the heater blowing, so I, it's a lot colder here. I can only imagine. Now, he's part of BuildGrowScale.com. He's done many different things, so he's an e-commerce consulting, coaching digital products a lot of different areas. So the easiest way I think is to dial it back, kind of figure out where you got started and then what's your main bread and butter going on now. So we talked a little bit before the interview and you're kind of telling me how you got started. It's actually a pretty interesting story. So yeah, uh, when it started, I mean I came from the offline business world. I had several different brick and mortar companies that were doing really, really well and had no intention of really even going online at the time until I uh, wound up having a a eye disease that it was hereditary that we just found out about all of a sudden I went almost blind in my left eye and would have continued to go blind had I not had a surgery. When I had the surgery they said hey you can't go outside, you can't work, you can't do all this stuff and I owned a Christmas light company, a landscape company, and a window cleaning company kinda crushed <laughs> the workload so I sold my companies and then was like well what do I do now? So since I couldn't go outside I turned to the computer, turned that thing on and I was like alright let's figure this out. And the first thing I kind of fell into was the whole uh, like affiliate model. I thought it was great. Let's sell something I don't even own and make money on it, make a commission. And at that time, eBay was just really coming on the scene. People were in awe of it. They wanted to do it. They thought the whole online auction thing was awesome. And there were, eBay was paying a headhunting fee of, I think it started out at 10 bucks, then went to 5 bucks, but per person you could get to sign up for the eBay program. All they had to do was create an account and you'd get a headhunting fee. And I started doing that. I started trying to do SEO, created a website all about the three steps you got to do to build up a uh, eBay profile. That was working and you had to get them to bid. So I would show them how to bid on a 99 cent object that they didn't care if they won or not because that's the only way I would get paid is if they placed a bid. Smart. That, yeah, that worked out pretty well for a while until SEO got a little bit harder, not much, but I wasn't, I didn't know what I was doing. So about that time, a company called Overture started making itself known, and that was like one of the original pay-per-click search engines. So basically, just like you know, we do on Facebook or AdWords now, you give them a credit card, bid on a bunch of keywords, and hopefully you make some money. So I bid on every keyword with eBay in it and sent them to, sent them to eBay to sign up, thinking I was going to get rich, and it didn't quite happen that way. I wound up you know, spending vastly more than I ever made in commissions and then quickly realized that I was going to go broke real fast playing that model. And then from there I kind of took a look at it was like, hey, I was successful in the offline world because I treated everything like a real business. What I was doing with the eBay thing was more like get rich quickie, like thinking it was going to be at this instant millions. I wasn't giving it the real push and uh, structure that it needed. So I started to step back and said, okay, let's how do I do this as a business? From there I bought a bunch of courses and I started looking at what the guys that were selling things then were doing. ClickBank was around, I saw the digital product world and I started saying, hey, why don't I create a digital product? So the first thing that I created was a how to build your own Christmas light installation business that would do six figures a year. And I built out, learned how to do funnels and copywriting and e autoresponders, email marketing, affiliate traffic. I learned how to do all of that just by doing it. And that kind of started my foray into the internet world and from there it's just been crazy. Now I'm, I'm curious, so this is a theme that I keep kind of seeing coming up and part of the way to penetrate the market is to be an expert at something, right? To be mm -hmm. just known, I'm, I'm that guy, whether it's podcasting, e-commerce, digital media, I'm that guy. But it seems like most people fall into the industry and we wear all the hats. You know, as you were saying with, with your own company, you had to learn copy, you had to learn affiliate marketing, you had to learn all these different things. So what do you think that balance is? I mean, what do you think that do you think that it is more useful to instead just learn one skill, maybe do it for clients, hang your hat on that, and then release a course on it? Or I certainly think it's a much easier way to get, you know, get into the market and get better at something. Um, so see, you know, back when I was doing this, this is like early 2002. Okay, the assets and the knowledge and the stuff that we have now, there wasn't anything like that. 
I mean, a, a product, the cheap, a cheap product was a hundred bucks. A good product was two, three thousand dollars, and it still didn't give you the step-by-step -step stuff that our seven-dollar products give out today. It just wasn't there. So, you know, uh, you really didn't have that many options. There were no outsourcing groups and things like that. I think the first it was getafreelancer.com. When that came out, that was like the coolest thing ever, and everybody's trying to outsource their entire business. And it just crashed because they, no one had the processes or the structure. So, yeah, with, uh, that was like with Get a Freelancer, and, and the Elance came around at about the same time too, back in the day. And you know, it was really cool. Like, um, I actually jumped into it as well, but on a different thing. I'm like, hey, all these guys are doing pop-ups, but we hate pop-ups. So let's make an unblockable pop-up. So, you know, I created one of the first um, DHTML. Uh, pop-up generators that would create four to six different templates for you and I outsourced that and it was great. I, did, I think I outsourced the entire software for like 500 bucks at a super high level of quality and that was great but I also tried to outsource copy and email and everything else and it just was too much because number one that early on I didn't really understand what I needed. I understood what I wanted but I didn't know what actually was what was going to convert. I didn't understand that you know the structures of really good copy. I could identify good copy by reading it. I could say, man, that copy costs a lot of money, and that, was, that, that compels me, but I didn't understand the different pieces of it. So I think in my case, especially when there wasn't the resources that there are now, it was very beneficial for me to get in and get my hands dirty on everything. Um, I like to know, I, in my business now, I don't do 90% of what our company does, but I understand how to do most of it, or at least have a decent enough understanding that I can communicate effectively get my point across, know when something's not working, and then know who to talk to at the very least as to how to get it fixed. But if you're starting out, it's so much easier now. Uh, when we work in our consulting and, and do some of our coaching with our clients, we specifically tell them, you know, here's the model you got to follow. But we don't force them to go out and learn WordPress. We don't force them to go out and learn how to integrate funnel structures or do a lot of crazy email sequencing. We let them outsource that because there are people out there that can do it and basically service skills in those kind of environments have become such a commodity that the prices have become commoditized. So they're very, very competitive and it's affordable. I mean, you can get, you know, your WordPress installed for like five bucks and then you can get someone else to set up your pages and do your stuff for you. you I mean, there's optimized press experts out there. I mean, optimized press, click, you know, click funnels, lead pages, all those things are a lifesaver. Yeah. When I started, I had to do I didn't. I could, Dreamweaver was too complicated. Front page was too complicated. I did it the hard way. I went to the bookstore. I bought a book called HTML for Dummies. Opened up my Notepad editor, and I started just figuring it out. My squeeze page was a red headline that was centered with an Aweber HTML form. Yep. And it actually converted like crazy. Of course. They do because it's ugly. It's simple. It works. But yeah. that was. I mean, I had a. When I had my auction website that we did, we had probably 60 to 70 pages on that website back then. Every single one of those came from a hand-coded notepad document. I was too dumb to even understand that I could templatize my own things and started from scratch on every single one, um, not even copy and pasting over. I mean, that's So now that having all this stuff, you don't have to be the expert or even the jack of all trades. You can really focus on what it is that generates the revenue for you and then outsource the rest. And that kind of stuff can be done now. It wasn't quite as possible before, and that's I highly recommend that for getting started because it's very easy, especially when you're starting out and you've got if you're in the digital world or you know the traditional IM world, you've got you know a sales funnel to build, you got a squeeze page, a giveaway, a product itself, a membership, some kind of continuity. You got to figure out payment processors. You got to figure out structures. You got to figure out uh, mailing frequencies. You got to understand inboxing, subject lines, all that stuff. It's a whole lot to do, and you got to do it all at once. Yeah. Right, so uh, what, number one, start sequentially, and number two, focus on the things that are going to deliver the most impact in your business. Do that and let somebody else handle all the minuscule and more labor-intensive stuff. In this day and age, it's so easy to over-optimize, and you can just go down a rabbit hole. And I would say out of the 15 things you just mentioned, you could probably go down a rabbit hole for 10 of them. Easy. Oh, a very, easy. very deep rabbit hole. The, and the flip side of that, though, is the people who come in the world thinking, I'm going to have an online business and I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to outsource the whole thing. If you don't care enough about your business to do some, to work it yourself and build it up, nobody else is going to care about it either. And, you know, I think it's very, very good to understand good copy, what it takes to write good copy. In an internet marketing business, if you don't write your own emails, 
and nobody's going to write the email the right way that it needs to be done, okay? Until you can afford to bring in a high-level copywriter who can legitimately write for you. A lot of guys use the swipe files that are given to them, which are legitimately swipe files are the most half-assed emails on the planet. The guy who created them didn't put any time into them either because he's hoping you're not going to use them, but by default he has to give them to you. So people just throw that in, out there and they wonder why it doesn't convert. Okay, you know, I spend the most time in my business in terms of you know labor writing the emails that go out to my, my subscribers. And that's why, I mean, sometimes they're novels, but I get huge click-through rates, I get great readability, and people are, are engaged by, my, by what we write. And that helps our business. But if I outsource that, I guarantee you it wouldn't have that same kind of connection. And I think part of that, too, is maybe finding the balance of what you like doing plus large impact. Yes, very much so. I mean, you know, we, do, we have a software division in our company that does really well. I can't write a single line of code. But I've learned enough to understand basic, you know, framing structures and how to communicate effectively with the designer and the programmer so that when I'm saying, hey, this UI sucks, this user interface sucks, it needs to do this, I can at least communicate it to them in some semblance of their language so they can actually get it done. Before that, it was like, you know, two people talking like this. You got a marketer and then you got some programming guy who's like, I don't understand anything you're saying. It's very funny you say that because earlier when you were mentioning these things, I was going to mention um, when you're talking about knowing copy and these different things so you can actually analyze them, I was going to mention something I'd always thought about was getting a lot better at coding just so that I could speak to coders. So it's funny that you say that you you did similar and now you've had a lot more success in that communication. Yeah, it, it, you know we have full time developers on staff. Uh, I know you guys do as well. And in our, and for both Los and I in our business, it's made it a lot easier. We did a project earlier this year that we spent tens of thousands of dollars on that we literally had to scrap because we were not communicating with the developer properly and he was doing trying to do everything that we had done but every time we give him this new thing we wanted he'd have to go back and redo the thing that he did before and we're like hey this UI sucks he's like now you tell me that mm -hmm. it's ready to launch he goes I can't just plop in a new UI I gotta go all the way back and you know and it turned into such a mess that we literally just scrapped the project and, and wrote it off we paid the developer for his time and said hey let's go on to something else and first of all we're sitting down, what is the process? When we have something we want you to do, what order do you want us to tell it to you in? And we developed that sort of process so that we could do that. Nice. Now, <clears throat> shifting gears, mm -hmm. it's funny that you got your start with eBay because I know, I know now that you're doing very well with e-commerce. You're having a lot of success. I don't know if you have any numbers that you can or you're willing to share with us. But yeah, um, I mean, I'd we, love to talk more about e-commerce. We honestly we don't do anything with eBay anymore. I mean, years back, my, I was a power seller. I was I don't know whatever metal it was, bronze type. I don't even have a clue. It was some kind of metal because um, I we were selling quite a lot of numbers. And Los also had a drop shipping eBay business before we even knew each other. So we kind of had started in e-commerce. And back then it was such a pain in the butt because you had to do everything. And there was it wasn't you're at the mailbox or post office like. 500 times a week. It was just awful um, doing all the fulfillment yourself. Nowadays, our e-commerce is centered around two main two main channels. We are very very heavy Amazon FBA sellers, and we for every product line and brand that we have on Amazon, we also have a corresponding Shopify store. Um, reasoning behind that: multiple channels for one, but number two, the biggest thing is when you are a seller on Amazon, if you're selling your own product, you're still pretty much an affiliate. You don't control the order process, so if, anytime you don't control the order process, it's not your business, flat out. You can't build a business if you can't control the order process. At any time, Amazon could take over our product, could tell us we can't sell it anymore, could take away our traffic, whatever. They could say no. Or not our traffic, but they could take away our internal organic traffic that makes sales. So we leverage Amazon as a great sales channel, but we build our other, other sales channel on Shopify. So if anything ever happened to Amazon, we still have our actual store and brand. And believe it or not, we make much, much more of our revenue on our Shopify stores than we do Amazon because we can control the upsell downsell sequence, we can back them into continuity, and we can have more control over the sales process. Plus our margins are better because Amazon is no longer taking such a big piece out of it. In terms of numbers, I mean, you know, we have FBA products that are doing $150,000 a month on gross sales, and we're not you know, we're not in the major 
um, nutraceuticals or supplements categories that you usually hear those numbers. And we tend to uh, focus on products that are super high margin and high priced as well. Our cheapest product in the marketplace is $79. Whereas if you go follow like the ASM model or the traditional FBA model, they're like minimum price point 10. Well, in our case, we follow a rule of three. All right, so at the minimum of rule of three. I don't even like the model, but it's, it's a baseline to start from, which is if the product's going to cost you five bucks, you have to be able to sell it for three times the cost because you've got a five dollar cost. Let's say it's five bucks, so we sell it for 15. That means the cost, the cost five bucks to resupply, it, it's going to cost, Amazon's going to take five bucks, and then you get five dollars profit. To me, that's not even worth it. We, we look for margins in upwards of 50 to 60 percent, and it takes the same amount of effort to find a good product that at a high price, that you can sell at a high price, as it does to find a lower level product. So we focus our time on that. And that way we, we don't have 20 or 30 products per product line. We just have a few. And then we can scale out from there, but every one of them, you know, our net profit is upwards of $40 a sale. It's a lot easier to have a nice, you know, chunk of change left over at the end of the month when you're netting 40 versus netting four. That and then our, makes sense. Yeah, and with Shopify, we can up back them into a continuity, a micro continuity program. They buy XYZ widget, and next thing they know, they're getting an offer to join the XYZ of the month club, or the, you know, if it's a if we have some fitness product type stuff in the physical world, that we can back them into a meal plan or an info or a info continuity program like a newsletter for four or five bucks a month, and we've just extended our customer value ext extremely large into a, a, a really big way. It's very easy too because once you've made the physical product sale, upselling them into something else is very, very easy. And selling physical is always easier than digital because you don't have to convince them of anything. They already want the widget. You're just making it available to them. Yeah, I imagine uh, physical copywriters probably aren't too many. No. Um, now, you know, there are some exceptions to that rule. There's like, uh, what is it, J. Peterman catalog where they have the amazing copywriting. They're selling like a pair of furry old man socks, but you read that little description as to what you're going to be like when you're wearing them and you want to buy those furry old man socks that cost $500. You are ready to buy it. So yeah, I mean, you can still do some really good stuff with copy, but it's much simpler because That's, it's describing the widget. Yeah, the big the big difference is the desire and the need. It's justified. It's, it's already there. You're not trying to create it. Correct. Yeah. And you're not, I mean, if you're selling it, um, an ebook on, let's just say weight loss. They don't see what's in. The, they just see an e-cover. You have to sell them on why they need this, and that's a work. Okay, you sell them a diet pill. It's gonna hey lose fat by taking this pill. It's instant, yeah. and it's tangible. Yeah, I think I think, and that's where I really like software because I feel like it kind of crosses that boundary of kind of being tangible. Correct, and we agree. That's why we have a we do a lot of software as well. It's easy to course to basically translate the value of what you're delivering, you, and you know especially in software, you solve a need or you make a convenience factor you know increase or whatever. You don't have to do anything crazy. You don't have to be like oh make X million dollars by midnight tomorrow you know or your money back. You say hey, this like our car, we have a software tool that's an abandoned cart tool. All right. It helps you recover abandoned carts. Sixty some odd percent of people go to a shopping cart and they don't actually click checkout. I do it all the time, um, especially with Amazon. I don't understand why I do it. I wind up going back and buying it, but a lot of times people don't. So what we do is we have a tool that lets you follow up with those people and remind them, hey, you got stuff in your cart, go buy it. So what's the value there? Well, hell, it's an automatic follow up to recover sales that you should have made. Easy value proposition there for people to see. It's like, hey, your tool costs fifty dollars a month. Great. If I recover one cart, it's paid for itself. Yeah. Easy, easy value proposition. Yeah. And and obviously, a lot of times, software cuts out the work. It does. Yeah. Now to kind of dial back with uh -huh. e-commerce, you know, you're one of the first people that we've really had on that does a lot of e-commerce. You guys do mainly Amazon, uh, FBA, which is fulfilled by Amazon, and you have your own Shopify store. What else does the e-commerce landscape kind of look like? What other business models are there in the e-commerce world? Well, I, it really all revolves around, you know, some kind of shopping cart platform, regardless of what it is, and, and Amazon. The other stuff includes uh, the arbitrage model of you buy something at a retail price point and you try to resell it for profit. 
Um, that model is, uh, there was actually just a post today, we're scrolling through my news feed, and um, Jim Cockrum, who's the guy, the silent sales machine hiding on eBay author, he was showing pictures of this big Target purchase where he went to Target, used this coupon that he got and bought some stuff on clearance, and he sh filled up four shopping carts, and now he's going to take those things and list them on eBay, or, I'm sorry, eBay, on Amazon, which is great. I'm like, cool, he's got all this merchandise, and he starts breaking down the numbers because he's showing his students and he's like, by the end of the Christmas season, all this should have, you know, should net me after fees and everything a thousand bucks. And I'm like, that's a lot of work for a thousand bucks. That's that's one of the models that's out there. Now, Jim has teams of people doing this with him, but you know, we can sell 15 products, which we do on the hour every hour, and make a thousand bucks. You know, it's a lot with with a better margin. The arbitrage model is is one of the, the a lot of guys get started with it. I actually have one of our coaching students who does it on the side. His wife, um, when they go grocery shopping, that's a, a group effort because it's like family time apparently for him and his wife, except that she takes three to four hours at a grocery store and he just wants to kill himself. So what he did to solve that was he got one of those little F, uh, scanners that you put into your iPhone. So he, he goes around and just scans items at the grocery store um, while she's doing that. And what it does is it shows what that product is selling for on Amazon and then it pulls up, you can input the price that you are, can buy it for, and it'll help you calculate the potential profit. So that's an arbitrage model using a scanner. And he'll just, while he's at the grocery store, just go around scanning things. And he usually, doing that, he makes about $1,500 a month just because, while he's wasting time at the grocery store. Not wasting, it's family time. Yeah. Um, but that's what he does. And, you know, he also owns a eight-figure uh, automobile wholesaling company. So he that's not an income for him. It's just... Just wasting time, yeah. um, and it's a way to start and things like that. I know a lot of other people teach the arbitrage model. Um, we actually teach the arbitrage model as well in a way of validating a product idea before you go out and invest in inventory. But we would never teach that as an actual model to, because you're building a job. You're not building anything that promote, promotes any kind of time freedom. So how aside from that, go ahead. How do you typically source the products with the arbitrage model? Is it? Is it? Well, I mean. So with the arbitrage, typically a product, like it, for most people, there's products out there similar to what you're already selling or you, that you already want to sell. They're already out there. So what you would do is find something close to what you want to offer. And let's say, um, let's say it's a corkscrew. Okay, you want to sell a wine corkscrew, or like some snooty falooty wine corkscrew. And you, you go to eBay and you type in corkscrew and you find this one that you like and because it's because it's uh, imported from China in such bulk quantity you can buy it for three or four bucks All right, that's not what it's worth perception is everything so then you go and you put up your Shopify store or whatever and you put that same picture you put that same product and you sell it for $9.95 right? and then you drive traffic to it with a Facebook ad or with an email list or whatever and when the sale is made you go back to eBay order it from eBay and have it shipped direct to the customer who gave you their address. So you're not actually touching the product you're, and you make your money on the spread between the actual item cost and what you sold it for. That's the, that's the basic arbitrage model and that's how you would go out and do it and that's how most people do it. They go to Amazon, they go to eBay, they find it cheap, mark it up a little bit. That is how people, and a lot of guys are trying to build businesses around that. I mean I know there's actually software out there that automates that part which makes it more feasible. Actually you guys have a software that does that. Um, makes it more feasible, um, but the margins still don't increase. So the, the next step from there is like, okay, you you sell a bunch of these, okay, and you've figured out, okay, there is an interest in this product. Now you go and you find a supplier or a manufacturer who can private label or produce it to your specs and say, hey, I want to buy these myself. You buy them in quantity, and then you either go to Amazon or Shopify, build up your store, and now you sell them direct. So if you're getting them, if they're selling them to you on eBay for three, they're probably buying them for less than half that or maybe a buck. So you buy them and you get them for a buck. Maybe let's say you're into them a buck fifty by the time you get shipping and everything else. At that point, anything over that you sell it for is profit. So nine ninety five, nineteen ninety five, whatever. And there's an actual one of the ex reasons I brought that example up is there is a uh, wooden handled like a beer opener basically. It's just it's just the it's like a, it's got a corkscrew on the back, but it's just, it just mainly for beer, but it's got a wooden handle on it. And we found it during a live case study. We found that just randomly on eBay for 63 cents. 
you could buy it, buy it now plus two dollars shipping, so two sixty three, and you had this cool thing. And they were like, okay, well, let's see what else people are selling it for. And on eBay, between that price and that, there's probably there's ten dollars, six dollars, four dollars, whatever, selling the exact same same thing. We went to Amazon. Somebody has it there selling it for thirty four ninety five, and they just changed the name of it and said made it sound French. And uh, same exact picture. Didn't didn't even take the watermark out of it. And uh, they're selling it for thirty four ninety five. Had a bunch of reviews saying how great this thing was, and they're they're buying it for in that price range of you know two bucks. That's that's where the uh, copywriting comes in, huh? Yes, yes. It's all about. I mean, you can sell the same widget as somebody else, but it's all about either packaging perception and some kind of competitive advantage. We engineer multiple competitive advantages into any product that we're selling, and it sounds like hard to do, but a competitive advantage can be as simple as, oh, you guys sell blue spatulas, we're going to sell a pink one. What's your competitive advantage? Well, this is for women. This is for girls who want a pink spatula. You sell blue ones, you're alienating a percentage of your market. That's an advantage. Um, you know, you sell something that's uh, like a roll of something that's 10 feet long. Well, guess what? We're going to sell a roll that's 15 feet long, and we're going to mark it up 30%. But you're getting 15 feet instead of 10 feet. Percept competitive advantage? Yeah. Does it cost that much more? No. It probably costs less than a nickel or a little bit more than that to actually increase the roll. Very easy to do that. Next thing you can do that is by image perception with packaging. You sell, uh, you know, sell a wallet, it's just some cheesy little wallet. Here, here's the wallet. Doesn't look all that nice. Put this in a nice um, box, nice black box with like a gilded printed, you know, logo on it. Put it in some packing paper or some nice uh, girly paper. Wrap it up, make it look all nice. Send that out, and ooh, now it looks nice. You take pictures of it that way too, and present that the higher level look on the site, and it sells for more. So it's it's just marketing. That's where real marketing is. It's not a matter of, it's like the, uh, what's the, like all the stuff you see, all the products you see on TV. If they just didn't present them nicely, you probably wouldn't want them nearly as much as you do. There's a reason that like now all the, all the kids commercials, like for like the frozen palaces and stuff like this, I have, I have a three-year-old, so I know this. Um, they look awesome. I mean, I want to get play with them. But if they just put them in the box and put the, took a picture of the box and put it on TV, you wouldn't have any interest in it. But instead, they show kids playing with it. They show you know, all kinds of music and stuff in the background because it's perception-based. That's how you get people to buy widgets. So image is more important than copywriting than physical products. Have you ever watched QVC? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get, learn a lot from those guys. Sometimes I, I, when I'm clicking through the channels for whatever reason, QVC is right in the middle, and sometimes mm -hmm. I'll stop on it because I just can't help myself, and I'm like, I gotta watch them pitch this. I'm excited. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, the new, like it's like the original ShamWow. I mean, it's a freaking chamois. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, nothing special about it, but man, did you? Everybody want to buy a ShamWow? Or the side works. Yeah. So product validation, kind of with the arbitrage model, and then what's the next step from there? So once you your own product, yeah. Once you validate a product, um, once you've got it validated, you know that it's going to sell or know that there's an interest in it. The next thing we like to do is do a, te a sample order from your manufacturer. Uh, most people order samples of one. We order samples 25, 30, even 100 sometimes, depending upon the product. Still a sample order. Why? So we can now test market the actual product before committing to a large scale order. Now, when we validate, we also build an email list. Why? Because that email list is the most targeted person who wants whatever widget is we're selling. So we get that test market product in, put it on our store, we send an email. If we can't sell it via sending an email to the warmest market we know, or and they don't like it, or we get higher returns or whatever, that saved us money from investing in a large order and bringing it in. And then from that point on, it's all a matter of negotiating with the dropship or the not the dropship, the manufacturer, getting your label. If you're going to private label, or are you just going to sell it as is? What kind of packaging you're going to do? And that's a discussion you have with the manufacturer. Most of them, especially if you're manufacturing in China, they have whether they're in-house or whatever, they have links to other. You know, hey, we do the packaging here. It just adds this much to your price, or we can design your label or whatever. And I don't recommend you use their designers. Go do your own. Um, because it'll, if you have them do it, it'll come back looking like something you and have all kinds of words in there that are just thrown in there because they think it sounds cool, like the you know your the ultimate spatula, and then it's the ultimate spatula for walking while happy and enjoyment because fulfillment. 
<laughs> that doesn't make any sense, but that's what they just throw words in there. So, but yeah, that's really the process would be validate, test market, and then go for production. So with that test market, typically you're using your kind of own email list that you've already built up through selling the products, similar products? Uh, through generating a, like a giveaway list where we're actually giving away the item to generate interest. And if people opt in to, to get it, that's the list that we're going to then say, hey, you know, we gave away this one. We have more for sale here. Gotcha. So, so that's kind of how you guys do it for your product. So you start product validation with the arbitrage model, if it makes sense. Then you move into kind of building the giveaway list. And I'm curious, how often with the giveaway list can you tell? I mean, I'm sure part of that is targeting, obviously. Targeting yeah. is a huge factor in paid marketing. But how often can you tell just by the response to the giveaway list and the opt-ins that we're probably going to have a winner or not? I mean, if you basically off the conversion rate of the opt-in page, I mean, ugly pages, pretty pages, that, that plays a little bit to do with it, but not much. If they want the product, you're going to have a huge opt-in rate, providing that you do target right. And let's say we did all that stuff right. You're going to have a huge opt-in rate. You're going to get a lot of people clicking and wanting to do it. So that would, that's a pretty good indicator that you have something that's, that's viable. The, the next part in the chain where that breaks down is product quality. Uh, it's a, there's a lot of crap products out there. It's easy to sell any kind of product once. Just getting the repeat buyer, the next purchase after that, and once the reviews come out that this thing's a POS, and I, you know, I can't believe I bought it and they sold it. Uh, and that's where the sample orders, like when we order samples, again, we don't order from one company. We order it from three to four companies because we want to see who's got the best product. We wind up a lot of times going with companies that are sometimes the highest, sometimes in the middle, but very seldom do we go with the lowest price company, which most people go for because we want we want quality every time over over uh, cost price because we're in it for the long haul. We're building a business. We're not doing some kind of quick rush hit. And it sounds like too from the quality as aspect, like you were saying for repeat buyers, you have these systems in place that you're going to get these repeat buyers so you need the quality that to actually huh. have them come back. Well, and you think about it from even a simple, let's say you're just an Amazon FBA seller, all right? You sell a product, they buy it on Amazon. It's crap. What happens? Well. Amazon will let them return it for free, right? They'll they'll take care of that. You'll get a re, you'll get a return. You'll the money that will have been given to you will now be taken back from right out of your account without you already say, without say so. On top of that, now Amazon Track is looking at your refund percentage. If you get lots of refunds, that's going to hurt you in the rankings. And that's just the minor stuff. What happens when you they also come back and leave a I hate you review, and they're a verified purchase? It's one thing if you get a bad review and they didn't buy the product. Another thing, if they bought the product and then they give you a one-star review saying bait and switch, this thing's a piece of complete piece of garbage, and now Amazon allows the customer to upload a picture or multiple pictures of the item they bought. So what if they take a picture of it and they show, hey, this thing fell apart when I stuck it in a pot of water. You know, it's a spatula. It shouldn't get hurt when it gets wet or it disintegrated. Pretty much kills your business right there because reviews with images pop up and there's the reviews down this side, there's reviews here, and then there's images right here. You can't hide it. And getting a review deleted, especially something like that, not going to happen on Amazon. So your reviews are your social proof. That's your trust factor on Amazon. So if you, if you don't have products that are quality, you're just going to get a ton of bad reviews, and pretty soon you won't get any sales. And that business is done. You might as well go start something else. You can't recover from that. Now, it, it sounds like from what I've gathered with the e-commerce space that the most important part tends to be the product research stage. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's two areas. And this is the same with anything. It has nothing to do with physical versus digital versus whatever. Uh, that is, number one, there has to be a market out there. Okay, oh, I got this awesome whiz-bang product for underwater basket weavers. Well, good for you, but there are no underwater basket weavers out there, or there's like seven of them. Great. Are you ever going to be able to sell all seven people? No, you you hit market saturation immediately, day one. So number one is figuring out that there is a market out there and that they actually want what you are what product it is that you're trying to do. Just finding a product doesn't work. You got to find a market first, and this is something that nobody does. They go out and create a digital product. Here's my you know whiz bang how to do X Y Z. Well, great, except that nobody wants to learn how to do X Y Z, and the, but they become so married to the idea because it's their baby that. They don't have to, They just can't let it go. In our case, everything is very analytical. We find the market first. We go, okay, this is a great market. Whether it's let's say it's the CrossFit market, those guys are nuts. 
They're crazy. They're very primal. You know, they they love and they will spend a crap ton of money on anything that helps them do a slinky pull up or whatever it is. You know, one of those, whatever it is, they'll, they'll spend money on it, right? So we know there's a market for them. Now we need to figure out what kind of needs we can meet with the products that are available. Can we develop something? Can we find something that's already out there and put our own spin on it? What else is selling? What do people like? Mating the two together, that's where the magic happens in any kind of business, much less physical products. Gotcha. So it kind of starts with what markets are there and what do they actually want and then what's currently for them in the marketplace. Yeah, or what you, what idea you have. You could take a combination of, hey, there's a, a tape and there is a ointment. They go really well together. Everybody sells them separately. Why don't I bundle them together? You know, you could do simple things like that. You could even create your own product and go to prototype it. Or you could say, hey, this is really cool, but if, if it could only do this as well, it would be that much better. An example, foam rollers. The most torturous device on the planet. I love them to death. I, I live on a foam roller. I've got two of them right over here. Uh, but foam rollers used to be nothing more than a big piece of round foam. And now they made them torture devices by adding spikes and knobs and all kinds of things. Someone just said, hey, let's take a product, let's make a better mousetrap. Let's make a more painful mousetrap in this case. And it works. The, the coolest foam rollers now, like uh, Pro Points and all kinds of stuff like that, have literally like triangle-shaped spikes all over, like, all over them. It looks like a weapon. Um, that, that's just, it's the same foam roller, but it just has a slightly different twist on it to make it more appealable, appealing to the marketplace who likes to hurt themselves. Now, is there a... Um... Is there kind of a progression that you guys follow for validation as far as like an MVP style? I mean, I, I guess let me dial it back. I know there's Amazon affiliate sites. So I always wondered why people didn't try step one with an Amazon affiliate site, see how well that does, see the products that do well, and then source those products that do well themselves and then keep the rest for you know Amazon affiliate, for example. Absolutely. We do that. Um, typically not on the front end. Uh, you can, and it's a great way, especially if you're really tight on a budget or you're really leery of this, there's no risk to you on the affiliate side other than driving the traffic. Where we will do this is through our email sequences after we've already built, been in a brand, we've built a, or started building a brand or a following, we will offer up some various different Amazon products to so just say, hey, check this one out, or what about this, and use our Amazon affiliate link so we can track sales. So what we're doing there is we're not just randomly selecting products, we're selecting products that we think have potential for us to come into the market and also sell. And it's just another form of it, but we've already built the list, we already have the following, we already have the brand in place with our other product products or product, depending upon how, how we are. And we'll go from there, we'll track that. The other cool thing with Amazon Associates, and it's being an Amazon affiliate, is you have a 24-hour cookie, which is pretty short, but at the same time, when they buy, you get... get a commission on everything they buy. And you can also look that up in your sales history when you go into your associate's account. And over the course of the month, you can say, okay, well, we sold X per, like 40 of the widget we were trying to test. But we also wound up selling like 60 of something else just on a random thing because people bought this as well. Everybody who bought this also bought this. Or a lot of people also bought these other things. You find other potential products quite by accident. And you find uh, aligned markets that are, you know, maybe one degree or two degrees of separation away from what you're already selling. Oh, okay, I have this list of people that buy foam rollers. Okay, they love foam rollers, okay? Who, who, who uses foam rollers? Typically, it's some sort of an athlete, a physical weightlifter, or someone who's just into really good fitness. You Really, if you're 400 pounds and overweight, you're not using a foam roller, okay? So you could kind of segment your market like that. Okay, well, the people who buy these foam rollers from our Amazon stuff, we're seeing they're also buying uh, paleo cookbooks. Okay, well, we could, you know, we could sell, we could sell, get some paleo cookbooks or put one together and sell it to the same market. They also happen to like uh, yoga for predominantly a large percentage of this market like yoga. It's not our core offering, but we have this traffic source here that we can leverage in multiple ways now because we find out what other things they off they like. We can go out and get affiliate relationships. We can do a joint venture with another company. Because the one thing to understand about business is your consu the consumer's desire to consume is immense. You can never satisfy it. So they may not need to buy any more of your foam rollers. doesn't mean they don't want to buy other stuff. 
And by being able to figure out what else that same market wants, you can further monetize and build a business that solves the needs of that specific demographic. What, even if it is not the foam roller anymore, now it's the paleo cookbooks. It may be the uh, uh, mood enhancing supplement that you know helps keep them stable. It, which you're like, I wouldn't have thought somebody who bought a foam roller would also like this, but because of through research and through tracking, you figure that out. Also, these people like yoga. Wow, okay. And turns out that you know 40% of our audience also happens to like mountain climbing. Well, another strategic partnership with that 40%. Now you've taken that same customer base that was a very mono-focused business, and now you have a million different directions you can head with it. And you don't even have to do the products yourself. They can literally be affiliate relationships or JVs. It sounds like the nice thing about physical products is once you get going, it seems to be very easy to grow. It is, and I mean, it's much easier than say like a where product. to grow. Yes, um, the same thing can be done with a digital marketing business. What I just described about finding parallel interests and degrees of separation can be done the same way. You just have it just takes a little bit more in depth research and demographic surveying things like that. But you can eventually figure that out, and you can do the same thing. Nobody does it because that's work, and they want they don't want no one wants to have a real business. But you can definitely leverage that for a lot more money. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And now, kind of to wrap up here, you know, as our time's running out, traffic is obviously the obvious question on mo for most people. Is it leveraging SEO, or is it you know you can make enough money off the paid media, or? Well, it comes down to uh, how much can you afford to spend. If you have a product where your mar you're, like you have a volume product where your net margin is a dollar, doesn't leave you much room to buy traffic. Especially if it takes you 50 cents to acquire a customer, that leaves you with a 50 cent profit. Now, if you could get a ton of traffic and it's very consistent at that price, you can still do really well if you're moving tens of thousands of units. Okay, but that means you need tens of thousands of clicks. In our case, we have a you know a 40 plus dollar, 50 dollar net profit depending upon the product. So that means we can technically spend and we control the order process. So we have upsells, downsells, all that kind of stuff. I can technically spend 50 bucks a click, or not a click. I'm sorry, 50 bucks to acquire a customer makes it a lot easier. I don't want to do that, but I can know that I can spend up to that because I know my metrics through our funnel that as long as I, you know, 30, 60, 90 days at that whatever point I will break even and make profit. Um, so in terms but in terms of getting traffic, if you follow at least a rule of 3 pricing or more, you can typically afford to buy very targeted traffic straight to an offer page or to a, a pre-sale page and then to the offer page and have that convert profitably for you. Um, so SEO is great. Uh, you know, video obviously is huge. Google Hangouts uh, to YouTube, embedded in, on a, on a, into like uh, SendWire and things like that, can be huge for your uh, SEO angle. SEO is great. It's just a slower process. It should be something that started at the same time as you start to find a product that works. But don't expect the returns of that to pay off until you know later. That's that's a a perk, not a focus. And the other thing is, is learning multiple streams of traffic. You can't focus on one traffic source. You've got to dial one in, and then you need to figure out another medium, whether that is another paid traffic source, which I highly recommend, or is that an email drop to a email list of, of subscribers that ha happens to be interested in what you have to sell. You're selling foam rollers? Go find a, a runner's list or a biker's list or a fitness list or a CrossFit list. See if you can buy an email drop, things like that. Media is one of the most important things in a business that you do. You can't rely on free traffic. You're not in business if you rely on free traffic. And then the next thing would be, as the advanced step, would be to leverage retargeting. That's one of the core focuses in our business. In Build, Grow, Scale, we actually are more interested in the retargeting pixel than we are in the email subscriber, which is a radical way of thinking compared to everybody else. You know, Our retargeting list is growing by 250,000 people a month in just one niche. And so, you know, a few months we have a million person retargeting list. We want to push out an offer. I don't have to send an email. All I have to do is turn on an ad and a million people are going to boom. See it. They don't may not click on it, but they have to see it versus an email that first of all doesn't get inboxed half the time or a percentage of the time. And then you have to compete with all the other crap in the inbox. And then if they see your subject line, they have to actually like your subject line to open it and then a percentage will see it and have a chance to click. So, and the you know, retargeting and combined with other traffic sources is where you need to be. Definitely. It, it's definitely uh, definitely evolved, the landscape. 
I mean, I think email is still huge, but oh, absolutely, what you're able to accomplish with you know retargeting nowadays is. Yeah. Also amazing. We still build a lot of email lists. I don't want to say we don't. We we we're very heavy on that. But in our grand scheme of focus, if we have to, if we can only do one or the other, I'm taking the retargeting pixel, and because that means later on I can go get them on the re, on the email. So one way or the other, I'm going to get their email address. Get but, you, uh, on the upfront, chance. correct. Gotcha. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, Tanner. I mean, I it's funny the time just flew by. I, no. Yeah, no, I had a good time. I love talking about this stuff. So I'm glad you had me on. And I appreciate it. I mean, like I said, you're one of the first people to really come on and talk about e-commerce with us, so I hope the listeners got a lot of value. I'm sure there'll probably be some follow-up questions and such. Uh, absolutely. No, it was a good time. Have a good one, man. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon.